Welcome to the Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast on YouTube. In this episode, we hope to help you thrive in life and leadership. And I want to tell you about two things before we dive in. First of all, how is your team culture? You know, my friends at Leader have an assessment for you to really tell whether your employees are engaged or not. You can check it out at leader.com slash culture. That's L-E-A-D-R dot com slash culture. Just click the link. And I've got something for you called the Preaching Cheat Sheet. I've been communicating, preaching, giving keynote talks for over 30 years. And there's a hard way to do it and an easy way to do it. And I can't do the hard work of coming up with great content, but I can show you how to do it better faster and far more efficiently so that you can really focus on what matters. I've got 10 steps inside the cheat sheet that will help you get to a great talk faster starting right now. You can just click on the link or go to preachingcheatsheet.com. That's preachingcheatsheet.com. And now to today's episode. Mike, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. It's uh, great to be here. Well, it's great to connect. And you transformed Grubhub from a startup into a multi-billion dollar business and IPO, which is pretty incredible. But your training is as a coder, right? MIT grad. So you're a coder. I would love to know. I've got a son who's a coder. So this is a little bit selfish. He's a software engineer. Uh, Did your coding background help or hurt you as a business leader? Well, um, one of the, it helped. It helped a lot in early days. And the reason was that, you know, the, one of the main points of the book is that, uh, start, start the thing that you want to do, start being the change you want to see in the world, start the business that you want to start. Uh, for me, that was easier because I could write the software myself. I didn't have to raise capital to go hire a software developer. Mm -hmm. And so I had direct, so I, I could start it myself and then I had direct control over what I was writing. So when I was selling restaurants by day, when they would give me feedback, but what they wanted from the product, I could literally write that, code that up in the evening. So the feedback loop was so tight in the early days um, that it really helped. Mostly, sometimes that sent me off on rabbit trails because I was a little too quick to listen to just one customer as opposed to my customers as a holistically. So uh, mostly it helped. Mm. Yeah. And I think a lot of leaders start there, right? We have a skill set and we're very good. I remember when I started in ministry, you know, I did the graphic design. I was a terrible graphic designer, but I did it anyway. You're sort of a jack of all trades, master of none. Although arguably, if you're an MIT grad, you probably mastered coding and you'd worked in it for a year. At what point did you realize that your ability to work in the business was becoming a liability? Like you needed to start working on it. Yeah, I remember there was one day in particular where I, I had been having a lot of trouble with my initial sales, a lot of trouble mm-hmm. signing up restaurants to start. I was not good at sales. I, I right. ended up getting a sell, sales for dummies book. And that turned out to be pretty helpful because there was such a huge gap between my competence and the basics uh-huh. uh, okay. that, that it really helped. Um, but there was a day that I avoided doing the work I needed to do, but was bad at, and instead did the work that I didn't need to do, but was good at, which was software development. And I spent eight hours doing it and I felt great at the end of it. And then I had a moment where I was like, that was a waste of a day. Like, I feel good, but I did not move forward on my goals at all. Wow. Okay. I think you just called the card of a lot of leaders. It's like, I know what I should be doing, but I really want to write the sermon. I really want to prepare for this court case. I really want to. And we get into our little rabbit hole niche and we ignore what we know we should have done. Had the difficult conversation with a coworker, uh, worked on a strategic vision statement or whatever. That's a, that's good self-awareness. Um, Go ahead. It goes both ways, right? Because we're human too. So if we set up ourselves up for a schedule where we only do the things we hate all day, it just gets hard to work at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, what I do is I practice this thing where I have, for instance, my email inbox, I have these sticky emails, things that are going to take some time and attention I don't really want to deal with. And I'll do one of them to start the day. I won't Mm. spend three hours on it, but I'll spend 15 minutes doing the hard things to start a day. Uh, and then I'll move on to the things that I enjoy a little bit more, but, but starting with a little bit of difficulty and then recognizing that you can't do it all the time. Um, that's been a helpful sort of practice for me. It's, it's not all the way it's dogma, not dogmatically doing the hard thing. Neither is it completely like in a cowardly way, avoiding the hard things. Yeah. 
You uh, also looking at origin stories, which always fascinates me. You were raised by a single mom in what we might call a not very middle class background. Is that fair? Um, yeah, yeah. It was my mom struggled. She had a couple jobs. Um, mm. at, you know, four kids, single mom, uh, growing up in what at the time was rural Georgia, although now is just suburbia. And um, yeah, it was. I mean, that was that was formative. I'm I'm, <laughs> I'm saying my formative years were formative, like. Yeah, of course they were. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that that influenced things like later on when I was when I was starting this, you know, I had a ton of school debt and I was very, you know, I didn't buy ink cartridges for my Mm. printer. I bought a tank of ink and used a syringe to refill them. I may have done that once or twice in the early days, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I remember that. Okay, so you were very thrifty. Yeah. I mean, you just, I mean, Warren Buffett says this, watch the small expenses. Right. And so how do you, how do you decide when you want to be strategic and spend the money on something and spend your time instead on, on the things that are valuable? And when do you, when do you do the cheap thing? When do you do the frugal thing and put a little effort in really, it comes down to what's your scarcest resource. And, uh, typically it's not money. Uh, typically it's time. Although I've come to believe that actually, even more scarce than time is attention. And they're subtly mm-hmm. different. Um, you can spend not that much time on something, but if it's the thing that's keeping you up at night and it's taking a lot of your attention, you're spending a lot of mental energy on it, even if you're actually not spending that much time on it. And so sometimes mm-hmm. you have to limit just the, the number of things that take up your attention even. And so early in the business, I had, I had a medium amount of time, a medium amount of attention and no money. And so I did the frugal things. Mm-hmm. How else did your mom shape you? Um, well, certainly she had me going to church like three times a week. So, uh, you know, grew up in a, in a pretty charismatic environment in, in rural Georgia. And, um, yeah, I mean, her faith certainly shaped me, her, she was hardworking. She never gave up on things. I mean, she raised four kids and, um, really sacrificed a lot of her personal, um, whatever she, aside from the kids, she wasn't doing a lot of other things. Um, and so seeing her put that, invest that much in us, um, really it was meaningful and it comes with an obligation, uh, as well to, to repay that, to, to make the world a better place, uh, in whatever way that means, uh, as a result of her investment in me. Hmm. So take us through the origin story. I mean, I think most people, particularly in North America would be familiar with Grubhub, um, you know, it, it became this huge, huge company, but you started out at MIT as a coder and that was a job that you, you're, you're pretty transparent in your book, Hangry. Um, and you're like, you hated work. You just hated it. So talk about that tension because there's more than a few people listening who hate their jobs. I liked the work and I had a great manager. I hated being employed. That was the part that was really hard. I did not, I have a pathology where I don't like people telling me what to do, which is a (laughs) fairly common uh, pathology among entrepreneurs, right? Mm -hmm. So um, coding for someone else towards a goal that like towards a goal or or mission for a company that I, I, at the time, I didn't even know what the mission of the company was, let alone did my life and my values align with it. And it's just really hard to go to work every day if you don't if you don't know what it is that the company that you're working for or the organization you work for represents, if you don't know what their goals are, um, not everybody has that challenge, but um, I certainly had that challenge that it really bothered me to not, to not know that to the point where the only way I can really know what the mission of this company is, is if I, if I create it, if I make it. And so I was the software developer, I was working for other people. I got, I was sick of my job. And then I had this idea that, I, I want, I was looking for some kind of company to start. I wanted to do something. And, um, it just was very apparent to me that calling restaurants on the phone was hard. And that's not a thing that was apparent. It's still not apparent to a lot of people. A lot mm-hmm. of, I see this online a lot. I don't see why I don't just call the restaurant and I want to pull my hair out when I hear that statement. Cause it's like, you can call the restaurant and put, put on hold and then read your credit card over the phone and then have the order mistranscribed and then sometimes it does or doesn't show up. Like that's a terrible experience. And Mm -hmm. to the point where usually when you say who wants to call the restaurant, everybody says not it, right? Nobody wants to do it. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. ultimately, you know, I went from 
not wanting a job to figuring out how to make an advertising service for restaurants to doing, and then it took actually about a year and a half to two years to doing online ordering for restaurants. And, and, and in the meantime, I signed up around two or 300 restaurants over the course of those two years. Uh, and I was making enough money. I started being able to hire people and that's, that's how it started. It bootstrapped. I didn't get investors or anything. It just started through, um, sort of organically me trying to solve a problem for myself. Yeah, you you had a few iterations though. It wasn't like one day. I think the iconic story. There's a pizza on the on the cover of your book or an illustration of pizza, right? You wanted pizza, it was really difficult to order, but it's not like you got it right right out of the gate. What were some of the different iterations, the dead ends that you hit when you were conceptualizing what would become Grubhub? So originally it was just an advertising service and I couldn't sign restaurants up. I was having the hardest time signing up for a hundred bucks. So when you say advertising service, what do you mean? Like internet advertising? Uh, It was online. It was internet. We published restaurants menus online. And and this was what year? Let's date it. This is 2002. Yeah. So if you're a young listener, this was pretty radical back in 2002. We didn't even really have Facebook then. Right. You could not see. Uh, this was actually before MySpace. This was a Friendster territory. Oh, before, way, way before back, MySpace. Way back wow. in the dark ages. Let me tell you about the dark ages of the internet. <laughs> uh, so, uh, yeah, so way back in 2002, yeah, you couldn't find the menus for restaurants online. There was no, there was no concept of user-generated content. People didn't upload these mm-hmm. things. You couldn't find them anywhere. And so the original version was I was just taking menus and putting them online. There was no online ordering. There was nothing. And so... I couldn't sign restaurants up because I was trying to sell advertising. I was trying to sell uh, premium placement for a hundred bucks a month. Right. And it was just right. really hard. And the thing, the first big unlock, the thing that made the business go from, I can't do it to, I can do it turned out to later on be a dead end. And so there's a, mm. there's a lesson here of like, um, sometimes the things that are good for a time are not necessarily the things that are good in the long term. And the thing that unlocked signing up restaurants was phone ordering. So I built because I was an engineer, I built a telecom server where calls would come into our server and then they would get forwarded onto the restaurant and we could, we could track them. And so we charged on a per order basis for the phone calls that were coming through the website. And that allowed me to start setting up restaurants really rapidly. Later on, that became a real liability because we were addicted to the revenue from the phone system because it was still, it was significant. I mean, when you, Mm -hmm. we were making a hundred million dollars a year, $10 million of that was coming through the phone system. So it was only and that was your VoIP innovation, right? Do you want to yeah. explain that a little bit? Voice over internet protocol. Do I want to, again? Yeah. Do you want me to get into the technical details? Well, no. I, I want to know a little <laughs> bit about it because I mean, it's yeah. such a different world now. It's funny. That's just twenty years ago, and you know, I'm old enough that I have a very clear memory of it. But I think for a lot of younger listeners, millennials and Gen Z, they'd be like, "What? What? What? How is that even a thing?" Yeah. So, so just you give used us to have the a phone in your kitchen. And it was mm-hmm. like one phone for the whole house. You did. It was one phone for a lot of people that didn't move around. Right? And cell so phones was, were still a luxury. There were no iPhones. Yeah, right. I, like I rich, rich people, too. rich people had cell phones. Yeah, I did not have a cell phone at this time. Uh, I had a Palm Trio, which was a, which was oh, like man. a, an i. It's like a. It was like an iPad. A tiny functionally iPad. useless. Yeah. The Palm Pilots. Yeah. I had a couple of them, and they were basically glorified digital calendars that usually didn't work. Yeah, they. They had challenges. They had challenges. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. So the phone system, the way what it what it did is is somebody would call from one of these non cell phones, non smartphones. It's not digital. It just goes over an analog circuit, and that goes into like this big exchange. And then I set up a a VoIP server, a voice over internet server that would take those calls, turn them into digital, and then it would actually call the normal telephone system out. It would convert back into that. But I had a record of the call and the record of the call is what I needed to be able to track the number of orders that restaurants. Because were. one of your challenges, if I remember right, was that people were saying, how do I know if this works? That's right. It's kind of like, how do you know that people actually came because of the billboard versus your Grubhub idea? Okay. Right. So this gave you trackability. It did. And, and it, the best thing that had been around prior to that was coupons. How many coupons are you getting right. that, uh, that had a particular code on them or something like that? People still do this. I mean, this is not, mm-hmm. I mean, there, there. When you go to a URL from on a billboard, you know it'll, it'll it tracks to that specific billboard, so the marketers can see how effective their spend is. Mm-hmm. Okay, so you did that, and it grew to. Did I hear you say a hundred million dollars using this VoIP system? 
Yeah, actually, it grew to a billion dollars in revenue. But uh, but at the time when it was only a hundred million dollars, um, the phone system was not great. Like hmm. restaurants didn't like it. Um, we were starting to get flack from U.S. senators about it. Like people didn't like, press didn't like, nobody what, likes the what, phone system. What were they complaining about? Um, whether or not the actual orders we were sending were were truly orders. And this was a, this, by the way, was a whole example in, this was, the, I learned something about press because the actual thing that was happening was, let's say we got a hundred phone calls. We could figure out that, okay, 73 of those were, were calls and probably um, what we would do is we'd say, okay, we'll only charge for 63 instead of the 73, knowing that some of them are probably going to be not correct. And so we'd always be really conservative in the number of calls we sent. But the press picked up on the idea that every once in a while, one call would get through that, that people got charged for, even though we were actually undercharging. That's what the, that's what press sort of like, like really uh, link, uh, latched onto. And so, but you can't, that's a, there's an argument about there's subtlety in that argument. It doesn't, even just saying what I just said wouldn't have made it on CNN. It was, it's mm-hmm. way too long of an explanation um, that we're actually undercharging because we're really conservative in our estimates. And so um, that was like, we, we needed, to, the company needed to kill the phone system, but it, but revenue is addictive. It's hard to get rid of it. And so mm. this thing that was like the unlock early in the business became this anchor later in the business. Um wow. And so that's like, there was a bunch of things like that, 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 that were, there were some things that didn't even, weren't even beneficial. They were simply dead ends. They were simply bad ideas. Um, skip the line, takeout ordering was terrible. Grubhub was a delivery company. Takeout orders were never a large part of the revenue or orders of the business. So all the software development that went into that was a dead end. So you experimented with getting people to take out so you could just show up. And of course, you know, a lot of menus, that's what we do. We live in the middle of nowhere. Just order your takeout, come pick it up. But for you guys, that didn't pan out. That was not, that was never going to be the business. Um, But we tried it. But here's the thing, you startups, and this is probably true with any business that's innovating, not just startups. Mm -hmm. um, It's experimental by nature. If you never fail, if you never hit a dead end, then you're not innovating. Um, you have to try things that you're not sure are going to work. Um, but then you kind of have a gut feel that probably will work and you're wrong sometimes. And so, so the dead ends are not, I don't look at them as, as failures or things that I wish I could go back and try again or do differently because, um, the, the path from point A to point B for an innovative product is never straight. It's a, it's Mm. a drunken stumble. And, um, (laughs) And so you have to you have to be willing to fail and you have to be willing to abandon the failures as well when you realize that they're not working. Wow. So you had a lot of success with this um, VoIP system, this phone call system. What was the breakthrough that eventually got you to what Grubhub became? So that was online ordering. So we had this VoIP system, which I tell you, it seemed like a good idea at the time. It helped, <laughs> it helped in the moment. And, um, and, and what ended up happening is I went into a restaurant, BB's Bagels, and this story is in the book. And I saw that they had a fax machine and he said he didn't want to answer the phone because he didn't want to staff the phones. They take too long to, to register the orders. And it makes sense if you're making $15 on an order and it costs you $15 an hour to or 20, $12 an hour at the time to pay somebody. Like it's actually hard to just make a profit on the, the person answering the phone, let alone making and delivering the food. So um, I was like, well, can I just send the order over a fax? Because I could just like hire, I, this is what I was thinking at the time. I could hire somebody like in the Philippines or Costa Rica or something to listen to the order and then type it in. And then I was like, wait a minute. Why can't I just let the customer type in the order? Like, why not just wow. make online ordering? It took, and I had already been doing this whole thing where I was digitizing the menus. I, I had been typing in the menus so that I could get um, Google and MSN and Yahoo to send traffic to my website. So I was already sort of publishing them in digital format. So the actual creation of online ordering, it took like a few hours. Like the, the, step, the step, the technical step from part A to point B was so small. And because I was already charging the restaurants on a per order basis from the phone system, I didn't even ask. I, I literally just started <laughs> sending orders to the fax machines. And I was like, 
I'm just going to turn it on and we'll see what happens. And like, everybody's like, oh, these are great. This is way better than the phone. Like nobody canceled. Nobody had a problem with it. Um, so it just their faxes. And again, 20 years ago, their faxes started blowing up. I think that the majority of orders probably still go over the fax machine or, or probably like 30 to 40%. Because, Seriously. Um, in 2023, it's still like yeah, fax. Restaurants still have fax machines and wow. tablets still go down. So mm-hmm. I don't know. I haven't been at the company for a number of years, but the time I left in 2014, um, it was well over 50% of the orders were still going by fax, not mm-hmm. via tablets. Crazy. Okay. It is so a that crazy. was the breakthrough idea. And it was the, it wasn't an idea. An idea makes it sound like I, a flash of inspiration, a thunderbolt from on high came mm-hmm. and I, and, and suddenly I didn't have the idea. And then the next day I had the idea and I was working. What actually, what actually was occurring, and this is an important distinction because what I'm about to say, people can copy. The, the mm-hmm. first, you can't just copy, I had a great idea, right? That doesn't happen. Right. The, wh- what worked was we were listening to customers, trying to create something valuable for them and making changes and being willing to fail and being willing to scrap the things that didn't work. And we And, and I was trying, every day I was trying things. And so- this was just the 147th thing that I tried. And then when it worked, it was like, it was obvious in retrospect, but, mm. and it looks like a, a bolt of inspiration, but actually it was the inevitable result of a process of innovation. And uh, it's an important distinction because you can create a process of innova- innovation. You can't copy inspiration. That, that's, just, mm. that's just magic, right? That's just Harry Potter waving a wand. That's, you can't copy it. So, uh, but you can copy the concepts of in- innovation. Well, and, and I think what's so interesting is you were pioneering in the sense that there was no Uber Eats at the time. There were none of the other services that everybody just takes for granted now. You're basically blazing a trail in this area. Yeah, t- Domino's had started about online ordering about uh, two years, I think, before Growhub did, I think in 2000. And there was a company that supplied that called Quick Order that was doing their own online ordering. And over the course of between 2002 and 2006, about about 150 companies popped up that were doing online ordering. Wow. Um, we, we largely beat out that first wave of competition. The next wave was really well-funded competitors like Groupon and Living Social. Um, mm. They both started online ordering. Um, Peapod, which had been doing grocery delivery, was interested. Like um, There was a bunch of other parties that tried uh, Micros and Aloha, which are the point of sale systems. They started doing online ordering. So there was a bunch of competition in sort of the second wave. And then the third wave was the very well-funded public competitors, which is Uber Eats and DoorDash. And so um, we did pretty, we always had competition, but we were ahead. We, we weren't first. I, this is a weird distinction. We were, fir- mm. I call it first best. So Yahoo was before Google, but Google was better. And so mm-hmm. Google wasn't first, but they were the first best solution. It would be hard to beat Google now. You couldn't just be best anymore, right? So you have to be early, but you also have to be better in terms of competitive differentiators. And so, um, and so we, I, I had a head start simply by virtue of the fact that as a software developer, I was able to to code up a certain number of pieces of software that just didn't exist in the world. So if if I were to start Grubhub now, I'd use a company called Twilio for the VoIP integration, and I would use Google Maps to figure out how to turn addresses into latitude and longitudes, and I would use Amazon Web Services, instead of buying a server from Micro Center and putting it in my apartment with a Comcast, like internet, <laughs> which is what I did when I started. Wow. So all of those manual things that were hard were, were a head start. They did give me a like an 18-month jump on a lot of the competition. But that, that, that distinction went away very quickly, and it became about being the best provider of product to the customer very quickly, not just being first. Hmm. I was going to ask you about that, and I think you partially answered it already, but what would you say in that sort of wave one and wave two of online ordering innovation, what gave you the market dominance that you had? Why did you beat out all the other smaller fish, so to speak? So the first wave, we had a couple of competitive differentiators. The, our system worked, which is mm. which is no small thing. That helps. In that early helps. days, like there's a lot of low quality solutions, right? So just be, just like this sounds like table stakes, but at the time it was a competitive differentiator. Our orders went through. The fax machines worked. We confirmed them correctly. 
Consumers liked the experience. The website was fast. Like it just worked. So that was actually enough early on to beat out the sort of first wave of competition. The second wave of competition was a combination of two things. The, the first thing was um, we cheated in terms of getting traffic to the website by by collecting all of the menus for the for the cities we were in and publishing them online, which which brought a lot of traffic to the website even before we signed restaurants up for online ordering. And the second piece mm. was we we bet the entire company on customer service. So um, something like 17, I think it's 17% of all delivery orders have a problem with them. So like hmm. it's a massive failure rate. You know, get a, you get a Thai iced tea instead of Thai iced coffee. There's a small fries instead of a large fries. You, you, the food doesn't show up. Like it's yeah. late. Like You it's ordered it dairy free. It came with dairy. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's, um, it's a very error prone process. So we committed all, almost all the companies available resources to not just answering the phone when something went wrong and making the problem better, but eliminating the problems. So sending orders to restaurants that had lower error rates, um, finding out ways to share best practices with restaurants. Like we really looked, worked at the root of the issues around Mm. why, instead of just accepting that it was a bad order, a bad process, we made the process better. So rather than just saying, hey, here's your money back and a coupon for next time, you actually got to the root so that that, what was the restaurant, like, that's a lot of work. It's it's harder than a refund. Did you get pushback from restaurateurs on how to lower the error rate or were they happy to see you and happy to take advice? Um, it's So we learned this from a restaurant. So I, I, this story is in the book where, we, where I go and, and a restaurateur, David Morton from Pompeii, uh, he, um, Pompeii restaurant in Chicago, you know, he, he mm-hmm. talked to us about this idea of like, apologize, give the money back. Yes. That's step one. Step two is the promise. Whatever happened to you isn't going to happen again. And so at the time we were starting to get pretty big. We had probably 10,000 restaurants on the, on the platform. The, the easier thing to do than fix problems at restaurants that don't necessarily want to talk to you is just send the orders to the restaurants that are doing well. And so we started with that. And then that created motivation for, for some of these restaurants, we were sending 50, 60, 70% of their business. And, mm-hmm. and when you start pulling orders away because they're messing up too much, it creates motivation to do better. Very okay. quick. So it wasn't like you were showing up, giving them a management class. It was just like, Hey, we're not going to be able to support you. Um, for the restaurants that wanted to engage, uh, that wanted to get better, that wanted to get more orders, we'd share the best practices and we'd say things like, um, you know, pr- print out the order and staple it to the bag and have the driver check it before you go out the door, whatever the, whatever the best practice Gosh. is like that yeah. alone might cut down the error rate by 50%. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, so we would share some of those best practices. So we were, what we were really doing is we were making delivery better. And so when you go, if you, if you order from living social, where online ordering is one of eight things that they do, or you order from Grubhub where it's higher mentality is focused around making the actual experience better. The experience will be better. Hmm. And so that was what we committed to. Um, and it worked, it worked beautifully. We beat all of the competition. We had a massive amount of the market share when we went public. Um, it was really fun. It was a really hmm. fun time to be in the, you know, it was hard. It was hard work as you mentioned, but it was also very rewarding. What year was your IPO? 2014. 2014. Yeah. And that's when you exited the company, which we'll get to. I want to go back because one of the things I thought was really awesome, you hinted at it. You said you weren't good at selling, couldn't figure that out. You could code. And then you literally went into a Borders, I think, and bought Selling for Dummies, those yellow and black books. I'd love to know, what did you learn from Selling for Dummies? Uh, There was a lot in there, but the the core message for sales was this. Uh, Step one is listen to your customer. Uh, step two is share your solution. Step three is ask for money. Uh, and it sounds simple, but I have an example of, of an investment bank skipping step one and not listening to the customer first. And they lost a multi-million dollar deal with us in the IPO. Uh, you, you just have, you have to listen to the customer. And this isn't like one of those things where you, where you let them talk, waiting for them to stop so you can sell them. That's not listening. That's, that's something else. Like you literally just have to listen to your customers, listen to what their problems are, listen to what their challenges are, create a personal connection. Um, 
And the reason that's so helpful is because if you do that enough times, you start you start hearing patterns and then your solution starts to match very quickly the problems, in our case, the problems that restaurants were having. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, you know, I've had, I've had a thousand entrepreneurs talk to me about different technology for restaurants and like 900 of them are related to making uh, restaurant owners' lives easier. If you talk to restaurant owners, they don't care about that. They don't care about the fact that their lives are hard. They care about getting more customers. They're like, if you send me too many customers, I'll build out a bigger kitchen. I know how to do that all day long. I can hire more cooks, but getting more customers is hard for me. Mm -hmm. And so that was the thing. It's over and over again. The only thing, the only thing the restaurants cared about was send me more customers. That's it. Mm. I don't care about your tablet. I don't care about whether it's fax or tablet. And like, I don't care. Like, I'll take faxes as long as it's new customers. So we start we start with that, listen, listen to customers. And then if you have a solution that actually is helpful, you offer it. If not, like say goodbye. There's no point in mm-hmm. selling somebody something mm-hmm. they don't need. Um, I had some restaurants tell me, I've got all the business I need. I don't need any more. And I'd be like, well, thanks for your time. If you ever change your mind, I'll be here. And they're not used to that from a salesperson, right? They're not used to this idea of like, I'm not just going to sell you no matter what. And by the way, some of those people would call you back later because, because, because I was being honest, right? I was being mm-hmm. genuine. Uh, and then the third piece is ask for the money. And people, a lot of sales book focus, focus on this. It's just a friendly chat unless you ask for the money. Uh, so, uh, yeah, I mean, so those, that's what I learned from selling for dummies. There's other stuff in there about prospecting and the difference between canvassing, calling, and a bunch of details. But really the core of it was those three concepts. You tell a really interesting story. I think you call it the best pizzeria in America. It's a block or two from your house in Chicago. Yeah. And uh, tell the story. I don't, I don't want to ruin it. So tell the story about this guy and set the scene in the restaurant because it was really yeah. interesting. So JB Alberto's is the best pizza restaurant in, in the nation. And it's, all, go. it's run by a guy named Tony. Uh, and it's literally, I could walk to it from my house. I didn't have to make Grow Hub. I could have just started ordering from, if I just found this place for the first place, I could have skipped the entire make a billion dollar company and just had great pizza. Uh-huh. Uh, so I, I was trying to sign him up. So this was early on. He was, he, he, that was one of the restaurants I went to pretty early. I was going basically in a, in a, if you just from the, where my house was, I was just walking to all the close restaurants to sign them up. And, uh, they just didn't, they weren't interested. They've, they had salespeople come in all the time. You know, I, I sit me down with like some of the, so it's the guy who, who owned the restaurant and then a bunch of like, I think it was, I think they were uncles. They may not have actually been related. It was a bunch of old dudes who Mm -hmm. sat in there and grilled the salespeople. And they like made us, it was like a sport for them. Like they enjoyed grilling the young salespeople. Like what else were they going to do on a Monday while I waiting for the business to start? So they, they, it was like, it was like duck hunting or something. Like I was just a target. And, uh, but, but they, you know, they were real, um, but they listened, like they listened and, and they also told me what their challenges are and they appreciated that I was listening to them. And so mm-hmm. um, over the course of, in the book, it's like, I condensed it into three visits, but it probably was actually like seven or eight in reality. I just kept going back and saying, okay, well, will this work? Well, will this work? And to the point where I stopped actually trying to sell them and was just trying to get advice. Um, and, uh, and in the end, um, the advice I got from them, they didn't sign up for years and years and years. And they ultimately they did. Uh, but I got tons of, uh, tons of advice, and especially around this idea of repeat customers are what really makes a business, not new customers. Uh, there's a there's sort of an anecdote that happened after the end of the book that that happened like about a year ago is that Tony called me up and he was like, hey, will you talk to my son about how to run a business? And I was like, I learned it from you, Tony. He's like, yeah, I know. My kid doesn't listen to me, but he'll listen to you. And so I ended up having a conversation with Tony's son while he was in college about entrepreneurship. Uh, and literally just parroting back the things that Tony, Tony had said to me, but it was a lesson in like, sons can't really learn from their fathers in some ways. Uh, like there's you just truth need to another that. person to say the same things. Um, but it's kind of fun that it's gone full circle. Uh, hmm. and I, I really, I've still, I'm still in touch with Tony and, uh, uh, he's a great guy. Did he eventually sign up for Grubhub? He did. He's, he signed up and canceled a few times. He was on and off the platform a few times. 
And uh, whenever he's on the platform, I order pizza. And still to this day, I only order on Grubhub, which is probably, even though I don't own any of the company anymore, I'm not involved with it anymore. I still have loyalty to the brand. <laughs> That's fantastic. Any other early struggles you think would be helpful for entrepreneurs to hear or other early breakthroughs? Yeah, I think, um, I think hiring is, it was challenging for me because I had never, never managed anyone. I got no lessons in managing people. I had, I happened to have a great manager at the one job I had between college and Grove Hub. And I learned a lot from him. His name was Kevin. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, you know, everything from like, who do you, when do you hire and who do you hire? You know, I, I learned pretty early on to hire people for jobs that I didn't want to do. So I recognized the things I didn't want to do. I also didn't do a good job at. And so, mm. so really the metric is, am I good at this or is somebody going to be better at this than me? And a good place to look is the things that you hate doing and hire somebody to do those because they'll do them well. And then the next step was I, the things that I actually came to enjoy, I actually came to enjoy sales. Uh, it turned out I still shouldn't do it because, um, because it turns out that other people who are professional and who'd spent their entire lives at it were better at it than me. And so hiring professional salespeople was important. So the who and when was hard. Um, you know, I, I messed up. So I started a second business fixer, which is a, a handy person membership. Mm -hmm. Um, and I messed up something in the early days at Grubhub that I've gotten right this time. And that was, um, I relied a lot on people I knew on, on my network to hire early at Grubhub. And I now think of that as a mistake, not because it was successful, but because the success for the people I hired lined up with the biases that were just intrinsic to my personal network. So I'm a white dude. Mm. So most of the, most of my friends are white dudes. Like that's the mm -hmm. way life typically goes. And so what ended up happening is by hiring people I knew, I ended up hiring with a bias towards that demographic. And, mm -hmm. and arguably that was, not arguably, that was very unfair in terms of the opportunity that was available within the startup world, especially for the startup that turned out to be so successful. So now fast forward 15 years. Now, when I do hiring, I always post the jobs on Indeed. I always go outside of my network. I, I make sure that to the degree that people are, I make sure that there's representation in the places I advertise. So in the construction mm -hmm. business, I don't just advertise on construction platforms because they're 98% male. And we're trying to create mm -hmm. a, a gender inclusive way into the trades. And so we right. advertise on Facebook and we advertise, um, we, we try and hire people who are working at Target or Whole Foods and give them a path into the trades where we can train them. And so, um, and so that was a mistake I made early on was relying too heavily on my own personal network. And instead, of, and, and it, it just embedded demographic biases that I regret looking back. Hmm. Yeah. And Fixer, just so people know, it's like a, uh, well, it's an app, I guess. I'm it is. in Toronto that yeah. where if you need a plumber, you find a plumber there. If you need an electrician, you find an electrician. If you need so someone. So not quite. So it's handy people okay. only. Uh, it's not, it, it's, we do handy oh, person work in the home. And it's all of the people who do the work are employees, W2 employees who we vet, full-time employees of benefits. They're not contractors. Okay. Uh, and, uh, and we train them from scratch. We hire people who aren't in the trades. We train them how to be handy people. Uh, over the course of years, sometimes, uh, and then we we do handy people jobs in people's homes, um, but it's a membership service primarily. And so we, oh, we okay. show up every month. So you you find us. You we usually fix the toilet, and then and then most customers sign us up to come back every month and deal with all the stuff that breaks in a home, so they they don't have to do with that, deal deal with well, it. That's pretty cool. What what are some of the examples of things you would? fix because there is something always breaking in a home you own so usually in the first three months we fix whatever's on your mind so so homeowners have a list of things that they haven't gotten to installing the fan that mm -hmm. that in the room that should have had a fan that has a light putting a dimmer switch in um you know changing out uh fixing the the um the weather stripping at the bottom of a door and exterior oh, yeah. door. Things All those like little that. things you're supposed to do on a Saturday and you never do. Right. All that stuff. Mm -hmm. And then after the first few months, it transitions to, we come with the ideas. And so, uh, usually everything from, so this, this month we changed all of the, checked all of the fire alarms 
checked the fire extinguishers and, and made sure that each house we were in had a fire blanket, right? So t- today was the fire safety month. The next month might, we might go through and every month we change all the light bulbs and every, you know, all of the things you just don't want to deal with in a home. We just do it. It's just a membership pr- service that does that. Oh, that's pretty cool. Okay. Well, like we may it. get to that. Yeah. We I don't might change get light bulbs in my own house anymore. It's great. <laughs> that's fantastic. Um, so let's talk about team leadership. You have a co-founder in Matt Maloney. You've taken on venture capital, which you several rounds, which you write about in the book. You've grown a huge staff. Um, what have you learned about making partnerships and teams work? Like many leaders, you, you got a lot of strong opinions too. Yeah, I think um, having a, a mission statement and values that are real, that people mm-hmm. use are really important. So that starts with not creating them by fiat. So you don't just say, this is our mission and values. You, you bring a group together and you have tough conversations about what are values and what aren't and what's really important to you as a company. Um, and so, for instance, at Fixer, one of our core values is respect because, because we're trying to create a gender inclusive employment place in the trades, which is hard to do. They are mm-hmm. historically very male dominated. Um, we realized respect was the most important value. Um, if, if people respect each other, it works. If they don't, it doesn't work. So, but we, I didn't just say that we came together as a team and we did it. And then, um, and then I'll, I'll use fixtures example. And I'll, it, this it was similar to what we did at Grubhub. Um, but then we use that for hiring. We, at, we make sure that people are respectful to the candidates are respectful to all of the people interviewing them, by the way, some of which are men and some are women. And so um, we're finding out if they can be respectful, uh, regardless of a person's gender. We're finding out. Um, and so we hire them based on that. Um, we have all of our discipline conversations based on our core values. We give bonuses based on the core values. Mm. So if customers mention that a, a fixer is respectful in a review, um, they, get a bo- like, they get a bonus for every time there's a mention in customer reviews. And then the person with the most gets a, a big bonus um, every really January. Cool. And so making the the values and the mission, the, the mission and the values, the mission is the thing that doesn't change. It, it's usually the same for 10 years at a time. The values don't change a lot. And then the goals, which change every year, um, making sure that everybody knows what they are and you constantly reiterating them and making sure that people understand how their daily work ladders up to the annual goal. That, that in total um, is, is what allowed us to, to be comfortable with people making their own decisions, having the empowerment and the independence to make their own decisions about how to work with restaurants. And as long as they're doing it within our mission and values, um, we trust that they're making the right decisions. And so we set, we set big picture concepts. We set mission and we set values and we set goals. And then, and then we said, go, and this is key. And then we got out of their way. Like, I don't mm. understand people who micromanage. It's a lot of dang work. <laughs> Yeah, and it, people don't like being micromanaged. I don't like. I don't understand why people like to make micromanage. Um, you, you need to hire people and then trust them, and then let them run, let them sprint, let them stub their toes and make changes. And let them, and then I'll also let them come up, with, come up with great ideas you would have never come up with. And that that mentality, Matt and I were aligned in that, and um, it works great. I mean, we had the graphic designer, the first employee I hired, who originally was doing stuff with paper menus, you know, he ultimately designed a Super Bowl ad, right? You don't get that opportunity when you're 22, right? Over the course of this first seven years of your career to get to that level, unless you work at a company that's growing real fast, where people just let you not just make mistakes, but make, make amazing innovations. And so, um, Hmm. that was the mindset at, at Grow Up. People were empowered. Well, one of the things, it's a pretty honest book. It's called Hangry, by the way, A Startup Journey. And I don't know that I have read a bi- biographical account that is that honest about the frustrations with business. And we've talked about the success of Grubhub, but you also said, and I think these are your words, that you kind of created a Frankenstein, a company that as much as you loved it, you were anxious to get out of and very frustrated at times. It kind of grew up in the monster started to attack you. How did Grubhub or why did Grubhub become a Frankenstein to you? So this is related to the, to the mission and the goals of the company and my mission and goals. 
And um, when I started, th- the two things were the same. It was just me running the company, right? And so I wanted to pay off my student loans. I overshot that by quite a bit, right? I, I paid off my <laughs> yeah, student Yeah, when you do a, what was the IPO? Uh, the IPO was 2.6 billion. Yeah, so, 2.6 billion. Yeah. I think your loans are covered. At that yeah, point. I mean, my loans were 260,000. So that's a million times as large, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> that's so, crazy. 100,000 times. So, um, so my goal morphed. It became, I wanted to help independent restaurants succeed. And, hmm. I, you know, the main, I would say the main theme of the book is that um, you have to define success for yourself. Everyone will define success for you. Friends, family, your church, your government, whatever. Everybody will define success for you. But if you define it for yourself, you're much more likely to hit it. Um, and, and that intentionality uh, makes for a very fulfilling life. And so my goal became to help independent restaurants succeed. And um, that, was, that worked really well when we had 20,000 restaurants and we were competing against Groupon Living Social, it worked really well. When we had 70,000 restaurants, we were competing against Uber Eats. Mm. My goal of helping independent restaurants did not ultimately jive with the public company's goal of maximizing shareholder return. Those are two different mm. things that I could not mm. reconcile. And as the company got bigger and I owned a smaller and smaller percentage of it, my ability to shift the company's goal became less. And so ultimately I decided this is not a goal I want to be on board with. It, I'm still like the company. It still does help independent restaurants, but it does it as a means to an end. It does it as an ancillary thing. It's not the main drive of the company. Mm. And so ultimately I decided I, I can't reconcile my, my mission and the company's mission. Then it's time for me to leave and go start another company. Well, at the time I didn't know I was going to start another company. It's time for me to leave. Ultimately I decided to start another company where I, where we wrote the mission into the bones of the company. And it's, it's really mm. intrinsic to the, to the business model. Um, we train people from scratch at Fixer because there aren't enough tradespeople in the communities we serve because most of the trades, there's not have, enough tradespeople period. Yes. Cause most of the yeah. trade schools have closed. And so we said, well, mm-hmm. if we train people from scratch, we're creating community benefit at the same time that we're creating profit. And so I, I built a business where the mission is much, my mission and my values are much more in the DNA of the company and can't be changed because by yeah. making a business model. So I'd love to know, because, you know, when you mentioned you, you built a Frankenstein, I've talked to a lot of pastors who kind of feel that way. Not that they think their church is fake or wrong, but it's like the thing, and I've talked to a lot of business leaders, like the thing I loved about it, like you, you kind of hinted at at the beginning, although this is not where you went, right? Like you loved coding, but then eventually you realized, oh, I can't code anymore. Not if this is going to yeah. be successful. Or now all of a sudden I'm managing, you know, 17 locations or five locations, or I've got 50 staff, not five staff. And I loved it when we could all sit in the same booth at lunch together. Now I got to rent out a whole restaurant to have a, a staff gathering and they kind of feel like they built a Frankenstein or they've ended up leading a Frankenstein. So I take it Fixer Fixer has scaled to some degree in the last six years, right? Since you founded it. Do you find with the integration of values, it feels less like a Frankenstein or, or, or how are you processing that? Yeah. I mean, I think I would separate out the feeling like the nature of the work changed and the Mm. mission changed. Those are two different things. So, right. The nature of my, I went from being an individual contributor, right? I guess the, I guess mm-hmm. the parallel is pastoral care and individual conversations with parishioners. That doesn't sure. scale to seven locations, seven campuses, nope. right? Uh, <laughs> it doesn't scale to one big way, location. Writing software no. doesn't scale. Like me being good at writing software didn't, is not relevant when you have a hundred software developers. Not, it's mm-hmm. a little bit relevant because I can at least speak the language. You can say, hey guys, here's the problem with the code. But, um, yeah. But the most concrete example in my life is that I went from, a meeting with a coworker represented an interruption of work when I started the business. By the end of the business, a meeting was my work. I couldn't do any work outside of meetings. That was the, the only thing I could do was influence other human beings in by talking to them. Uh, and so the nature of the work changed and I was fine with it. I didn't mind the nature of the work changing. And so that's one thing it's, but it was, it, 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 I liked coding. I also liked being in meetings and managing people. Like I found, I found them challenging. I learned and I liked certain aspects of all those things. It was really the departure from mission. And so 
um, I, I think in the church situation, if it went from we grew because we were really great at serving people to uh, now we have to keep our numbers up to pay for our mortgage for our seven campuses. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's a that's a departure from mission, not a change mm-hmm. in the nature of the work. And you should be upset about it. You should be depressed about it. You should be mad as heck about it and do something to change it. No, that's that's a really good point. And I think the machine ends up running them, right? Yeah. And you would were you burnt out by the time of the IPO at Grubhub? How would you describe your emotional condition? Um, I I wasn't. I I was like ready Mm. to work some more, but um But it looks like burnout because working towards a vision you don't, you aren't compelled to be a part of looks a heck of a a lot like I just, I just am tired. Mm. Uh, And so I don't Mm. think I was burnt out. I think I just disagreed with where, with what I, what my effort could bring about at the company. I didn't want that to be um, my effort. I didn't want to be that, that be where I was putting my energy. And so it looked it looked like burnout because I didn't want to put my energy towards it, but it wasn't because I didn't have energy. I mean, I, I then went and rode a bicycle across the United States. So I yeah. still had We're plenty of energy. <laughs> We're going to get there. Yeah. What impact did a startup have on your marriage? Because you got um, some sections in the book about marriage. You got a chapter on your marriage. What impact did that have on you and your wife? Uh, disastrous, I think. Okay, fair <laughs> enough. Uh, I mean, we came close to divorce. Um, mm. And it was really challenging. There was... Um, there was a period. So my, my wife was, is also a recovered attorney, much like yourself. Mm-hmm. And, uh, so she worked, she got a fellowship at international justice mission, which is an organization that sends oh, yeah. attorneys internationally. And she went to go train, mm-hmm. um, attorneys first in Zambia and then in Chennai, India. And, uh, with that organization as a, as a fellow and man, it would have been it, at the time we were like, great, I can work on Grubhub and you can go do this and we'll come back together at the end of it. We had been married by six years by the time that happened. And, um, in retrospect, boy, it would have been great to experience that with her, like to grow mm-hmm. in mm-hmm. that place mm-hmm. where I was there with her. And there were so many times where my career took priority over her career and it was, uh, it wasn't fair. And so, um, and, and she reacted with resentment out of that unfairness, which is the appropriate emotion to, uh, mm-hmm. and, and so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think I, I caused some real challenges there. Yeah. And what was that? Was that just the, uh, there were a lot of hours. I think at one point you said when you were, uh, you know, you were working 80 hours a week, that kind of thing. What were some of the factors and how has that changed since you launched Fixer or walked away from Grubhub nine years ago? Um, at the time we didn't have kids and the, and the typical work week, which was 60 hours, it probably, it didn't very often get to 80. Mm-hmm. It would have been fine. I don't, I don't think that's the thing that really caused the challenge. We still could find time to spend time together. Yeah. That would not work now that I have a kid. There's no way I could find time for family and work at 60 hours a week with a kid. But we, we would have been fine. I think it was really that um, the choices I made, which really anchored us in Chicago, um, kept her from being able to work in D.C. for IJM, for example, or in Geneva or somewhere where her, her work in international human rights Um, would have been, it's just hard to get an international human rights job as a lawyer in Chicago. There's like exactly zero jobs for that. (laughs) So, um, and so it was, it was more the choice of putting my work before her work is what really caused the friction. Again, it's, it was really more about mission alignment than it was about the day to day. Mm -hmm. Being married to an attorney, I can tell you that is a challenge. We had to make those decisions we met in law school it's like, who's going to have the dominant career? And by mutual agreement, we agreed it would be mine that I would work at the church. And we never knew we'd end up doing this. Uh, and now it's a much more equal split that the kids are older and gone. But yeah, that's that's a real challenge. Yeah. It can be. It's different now. At Fixer, I, I had the luxury of being able to hire a team from day one instead of doing it myself. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. architected my week around the idea that I have extra time, but I'd be lying if I said, you know, my daughter was homesick yesterday with an ear infection. And it just, it was like a bowling ball just like crashed into all of our plans and schedules. And you still have to make the choice, which one of the two of us is going to sacrifice our work day to watch the kid. Uh, Mm. And more and more that's me as opposed to her, because um, 
because that's the stage of life we're in. But I've also set up the company so that I don't need to be there every day. I don't micromanage. That's very intentional. I've been thoughtful and upfront about my time commitments at work. What are the other value um, challenges you had? You have very strong thoughts around the gig economy, contract workers. You mentioned at Fixer, everybody is a W-2 employee. Um, and I think you advocated at one point when you were at Grubhub that, hey, what's going on with this gig economy that we're kind of building into? Because again, that wasn't even a term that I don't think was around in 2002, gig economy. It, uh, it was not, it was, it was, and Grubhub was one of the pioneers. And so, mm-hmm. um, I, I have my, I have two major issues with the gig economy as it currently exists. And the first one, um, is that our, our society, there's an expectation among professional, among all workers in our society that we have economic mobility and our earning power increases from our twenties up through at least our forties or fifties. And because of that, we go from being in debt to not being in debt to being able to save for the future. Yep. If you work five years at, as an Uber driver, you have no more marketable skills and you are no more economically, vi- like you have no, no more earning potential than when you started. There's so no as path. a full-time 40-hour-a-week mm-hmm. role, it, it doesn't fulfill the social contract that we expect so that people will be able to live their lives through to retirement. And I think that that's really challenging. Now, is that the company's problem to solve? I don't know. Maybe, maybe not. But like there's there's something wrong about just saying it's not our problem and it's 40 hour a week job and there's no advancement. In it. And that, that that's one thing that really bothers me about the 40 hour a week version. Now, the 10 hour a week side hustle with lots of flexibility for the person who has a lot of commitments, that's actually a really good thing for our society. That's sort of my first issue with the gig economy. Hmm. The second issue with the gig economy is that... Um, for good or for ill, in the United States, we expect employers to pay for health insurance. And our mm-hmm. entire society is built around, our entire healthcare system is built around that premise. There is no, there is no public option. And so mm-hmm. by sidestepping that responsibility using gig economy workers, um, what, what the companies that use them are really doing is they're putting, they're taking that burden and they're putting it on the community, the local communities. So mm. the hospital that has to offer services regardless of income level or massive amounts of debt within for individuals or whatever the case is. And so um, on either we, either we need like we need to say that companies are not responsible for health care or all companies must be responsible for health care. But letting some mm. just skip out on their responsibility is not actually it's actually the opposite of a, of a good free market because wow. you've created protections for a class of companies that shouldn't have it. And so that's my other issue is the gig economy is it, 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 doesn't, in, it doesn't actually um, cover the real costs of doing business in a community. So you went from running a company that was really the gig economy. You probably had some brass at the top of Grubhub, but a lot of it was gig-based to a company that is not gig-based. What do you see in the difference with your teams? Um, yeah, so the so my current company is, is entirely employee oriented. It, it's all, all employees. There's there's a training element so that the people we who enter and have no trade skills, we train them, and then they continue to acquire skills over time. And then eventually they leave to go become electricians or plumbers, where they can make more money, right? And so they're with us for a time. Um, there are things that are harder about it. Right. We have to work through issues when, when somebody has scheduling issues related to a family situation or they have um, they get sick with COVID or what, whatever. When, it, when something happens, we have to be committed to helping them through that, seeing them through that um, to the degree that we can. And it's really easy to just wash your hands of it if you're if it's a gig economy situation. And so that's harder. Yeah. But the result. But the but the flip side. So that's just the harder part. The flip side of that is um, our workers are incredibly highly skilled and they care about the work that they do in customers' homes. And so the product that we deliver to customers is much higher than we could ever possibly do with gig economy workers. And so ultimately, since businesses exist to create value for customers, it's the way to go. So mm-hmm. um, so it's a mixed bag, right? It's way better for customers, but it's, it is a little bit harder to run the company because and it's harder because you have to care about the people you work with, which by the way, 
is probably a good thing, right? Yeah. So um, it's it's been more challenging for sure, but it's also been a lot more fulfilling and rewarding. Well, and you you can standardize things too. I got into an Uber recently. I was in Tennessee. And I don't know whether their standards had dropped or whether I just got the wrong driver, but I'm like, is this car even roadworthy? Like it was bad, like really bad. And I don't know, man, it's a really interesting moment in history. Mike, you also said entrepreneurs have to be great at quitting things. So what are some things you've quit that you're grateful for? And is there anything that you've quit that you're like, "Mm, that was too soon? Um, yeah, I say, well, I say that they, the entrepreneurs have to be good at quitting things because it, the nature of what they're doing is innovation. And mm. um, you can't know, if you're truly innovating, you can't know that every single thing you're going to try will actually work out. I mean, the thing I'm most happy I quit was growth. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah. uh, there was misalignment between my goals and my values and where the company was headed. And I don't think they're an evil company. I don't think mm. that they're a bad company. I just think I wanted something different from what the stakeholders and shareholders of the company wanted. And, and so leaving was the right thing to do. You can either change the thing you're working on or like I could have, I could have made Grubhub come back in the line with my goals or I could leave and go do something else. And so um, rather than get hung up on the fact that I'd been there since I started it, it was my baby. I had all of this. um, There's a lot of vanity reasons to stay. Right. Like mm-hmm. I could kind of sit back and just take the accolades and go to conferences and it would have been great. You know, mm-hmm. hangry, the book I wrote, it would have been a very different book. Uh, probably mm-hmm. would have sold better if I could use Grubhub's email list to sell it. Um, mm-hmm. Since I'm not super complimentary about the company in the book, they, as you might imagine, did not decide to send out. Yeah. They, they probably were going to email this book out to their yeah, list. They didn't. Yeah. So, um, so I think that that was a good decision for me. Ultimately it led to my cross country bike trip, um, I was able to spend the first two years at home with my daughter and I was able to start another company. And I couldn't have done any of those things if I didn't have some cost thinking. If I didn't say, I put that money and that effort and that energy and that youth and all of that into that company. But starting today, that's not the right decision. And I'm not going to let my past decisions govern what's good for me today and in the future. And so that was like, that was a great one. Um, I think quitting software development at the time I was in Grubhub mm-hmm. was a really good idea. Moving towards really putting my energy towards leading a company instead of writing software. That was good. Um, I think the second part of your question is, have I quit anything that I regret quitting? Yeah. 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 Um, and I've tried to learn Spanish like five times. <laughs> <laughs> I just, I just keep, I just can't, I just, I have not. Claire, okay, no, I have not figured out how to speak. Spanish. <laughs> um, and every time I put my effort, I, I end up just, I don't know, watching TV or something. So Yeah, fair enough. Oh, that's great. Okay, we got to talk about your bike trip. I'm also a cyclist, but you exit Grubhub. You don't have any more financial worries. Your student debt is paid. You've got significant amounts of money in the bank and investments. You decide to go on a cross-country bike trip on a recumbent bike. So I'm a cyclist. I would, I would, before you revealed that, I'm like, oh yeah, I can imagine what that looks like. Then all of a sudden, okay, I think 99% of people don't even know what a recumbent bike is. Can you explain it? I do. And I'm like, holy cow, like good for you. Yeah. Recumbent bike is, uh, instead of sitting on a saddle, you sit in a lawn chair and uh-huh. you have a, you still have a wheel in front of you and a wheel back of you, but you're angled. You're ang- you can be angled a bunch of different directions because there's a bunch of different types of recumbent bikes. So, but I was angled just a little bit back. And the whole reason I did it they're not actually much harder to, to ride They're They're, um, they're actually, they take less effort because you have a windshield. So, um, it's almost like a bike trailer. If you can imagine it, if you've ever seen, you know, parents pulling their kids in a bike trailer, yeah, it's almost a little bit like that. It's triangular and, uh, you're sitting back pedaling like you would on a paddle boat, only you're almost fully reclined. But I was not almost fully reclined. I was only back oh, you were. 10 degrees. So similar to like oh, okay. you'd sit in a, in a car seat, in your, a driver's seat in your car. So I was not. Oh, I didn't super, realize that. I, I haven't seen reclined. that model. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was not way back. And the whole, re- but I was just a little bit back. The whole reason I did it, and this is, this, it might sound like a silly reason, was when you're on a road bike, you're typically looking at the little white stripe on the road. Your, your head mm-hmm. is angled down and it hurts your neck to look up. 
for like a, it will for like over, six hours. If you tried to look mm-hmm. on the horizon, your neck would be killing you. I I rode the Recumbent bike so that my eyes were just on the horizon. I just wanted to look around. That was it. I wanted oh, to see the country. Cool. That was the whole reason for the Recumbent bike. So you could have done that on a mountain bike or on a hybrid bike or on a city cruiser. Uh, I'm just I'm just curious. But Recumbent bike just fit the bill. It did. I mean, it just. I mean, sitting there on a lawn chair, having my hands rested, it was great. It was way more comfortable. Um, but I mean, I still had to turn that crank a million times to get across the country. So it still took a lot of effort. Yeah. And did you, did I read this right? Did you train on a road bike to prepare for this? And yes. and then you end up in a recumbent? Not, not the same thing. No, I ordered the recumbent like six months prior to the trip and it showed up like three days ahead of time. And, uh, <laughs> Actually, on my fr- I took one practice ride before I left, and I fell over on the thing, like skinned my knee. So I started the trip with a skin skin knee. Congratulations! Uh, I wouldn't recommend that. I would recommend getting it a little earlier. Uh huh. And what did you learn on that cross cross country trek? Um, the, one of the really significant moments for me. Um, so, you know, when I was w- right before the IPO, we we used an investment bank like everybody does for an IPO, and the investment bank. You, know, you have to fly around to all these different investors and they, they provided a private jet for us to fly around to all these different investors. And so the final trip from Chicago to New York to do the IPO, uh, I mean, the, the meal that they served on the plane, it was like a celebration, right? But it was like lobster and steak and shrimp and all this amazing stuff. And it was magical. It was great. And there's an investment banker there and he's very eager and really good at his job. And I had a conversation with him on the plane. It was great. Fast forward, this is only a month later, 30 days later, and I'm on maybe 40 days later, I'm, I'm setting up my tent in like a city park in Kansas on my bike trip. And a kid comes up from a church and says, Hey, mister, I've got these peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Here you go. And would you like to come to our Bible study? Well, first, yes. First, yes. Do, do you know Jesus is your personal Lord and Savior? And I'm like, I do, but I just want to eat my mac and cheese. Leave me alone. <laughs> and so like, I, was, I did not want to talk to him, but I was like, I, on the outside, I was like, Hey, thanks for the sandwich. Cause I was trying to not be a total jerk, but I did end up having a conversation with this kid. He's probably 17 years old. He gave me a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. It tasted great. Which, which person do you want to talk to? Do you want to talk to the investment banker on the private jet? Do you want to talk to the kid who brought you a sandwich out of the goodness of his heart? Mm-hmm. You want to talk to the kid with a sandwich? Mm-hmm. And I, I mean, I think this was the thing that I knew that I relearned on the bike trip is that, um, the relationships that I, I value with just um, just the people that I come across in my in everyday life, um, I valued those a lot more than the investment banking relationships and, and the investor relationships in the startup world. It's that world's very skewed, and so um, and and I just learned that lesson again and again and again on the trip. I would go into a town, and they'd say things like, "Hey, this trip you're on a bike is great, but I'd be careful. You know, two towns down, they're all crazy." And in the next town, they're okay, but be, be careful when you ride out of here. And you, you go two towns over and turns out, and by the way, that person who said that was incredibly nice. They invited us in their home. They made me a cook, home cooked meal. You know, they sent me on the way with cookies, like just incredibly gracious and kind and wonderful people. And I get two towns down and I meet the same incredibly kind and gracious and wonderful people. And they are so nice to me and they, and they take care of me and they give me a place to sleep or I can sleep in a tent in their yard or whatever. It just happens again and again. But the people in that town, they're like, watch out. Those people in two towns down, they're crazy. Watch out. For <laughs> and so what I learned was everyone in the country is amazingly gracious and kind and wonderful. And they all think that everybody else isn't. <laughs> and they're all wrong. Like they're all wrong about the second part. Um, and I just saw it again and again and again, that people were kind and gracious and loving and caring and welcoming. And, um, and, and, and yet they all also carried this fear of, of others. And, um, it was really, it was a, it was a weird message thing to learn both those things at the same time. Hmm. Talk about the physical, the physicality of riding across America. I mean, yeah, man, I, I empathized with your description of your hamstrings. So it was a 4,500 mile bike ride. Um, but it, in some sense, it wasn't. It was actually 90, 50 mile bike rides. Mm-hmm. And the first 10 of them were real hard. And the next 80 were actually pretty easy. 
So um, it turns out that you, you really can't train for cycling eight hours a day unless you cycle for eight hours a day. And so the first mm. two weeks were always going to be very painful. And I think that's, that was true for most of the other riders that were on the trail. And so um, it was really hard getting up the Blue Ridge Parkway uh, in, in Kentucky. It was so painful and I was so tired, but I then took some rest days. I, this, this great guy, Thomas, told me to take some days just totally resting. I recovered, my muscles healed. And then I got much stronger to the point where when I, when I went up the Rockies, when I went up Hoosier Pass, um, it just, it wasn't that hard. I just like pedaled to the mm. top. And so, I mean, there's something about, there was something pretty magical about losing 30 pounds and like while eating 6,000 calories a day. I mean, I ate like a king. It was great. And, uh, and I just got strong. My body just got really, really strong. You know what it reminded me of mm. was um, when I was like 15, 16, 17, when I was first developing into a man i just remember like oh i'm strong like i never used to be strong and now i'm strong and it wow. felt really good uh, i remember sort of reading a book that talks about that and being like oh yeah that's how i feel and then it felt good to go through that like at 40 it felt really good to like get strong again uh at that age it was really satisfying um and then i thought it was going to be this amazing spiritual journey i thought i was going to get a chance to pray a lot um it turns out i was mostly just tired all the time and i i didn't like I was just like, Fair. I'm pedaling and now I'm eating and now I'm sleeping and now I'm pedaling. And, I, and, but then by the time I got into the Rockies and was really getting much stronger, I wasn't as tired as much. And I got a, I got a chance to ponder and to think and be introspective and to pray. And so, um, the second half of the trip became much more spirit. Well, maybe the first half actually was very spiritual and I just wasn't as mindful of it. But, um, mm -hmm. the second half of the trip, I had time to think about it more. Well, any insights that stick with you? It's real hard to be present. I got like, I don't know, 12 minutes over the course of 4,500 miles where I was just content and in the moment and not worried. Um, and I think of those moments as very deeply spiritual, um, but they're, they're very rare. Those moments of contentment and peace, they're incredibly rare, even when you have three months dedicated to it. Um, so that was, that was insightful. Um, you know, I, I had a few moments when I was writing, especially when I was writing solo through Kentucky and Tennessee and, um, and Illinois a little bit, where I was by myself and I just had all the time in the world. And so I'd be sitting at a gas station and I became this, it was weird. I was almost like a traveling confessor. People would just tell me about their lives simply because I had time to mm. listen. I just, um, I just had time. I just had time to, um, I think you had a guest on who had talked, his first book was about, um, radically reducing hurry in your life. Mm, um, yeah. John Mark Comer. Yeah. Mm. He, he, I mean, that's what happened is I wasn't in a hurry and people talk to me. People, I, right. if people, you're just sitting there eating a candy bar and sipping a Coke with a weird with looking the time bike. in the world, yeah. with a weird looking bike, people <laughs> come up and start talking to you. Right? They do. They do. And, and so, you're not in a rush. Right. Yeah. Some of those conversations huh. were two hours long and you know, I, I learned the importance of slowing down and listening mm -hmm. and being open to people. I have since forgotten that, <laughs> but at the mm -hmm, time mm -hmm. I learned it. <laughs> no, and you know, it's interesting, almost a decade later, this is a recurring theme on the podcast too, because we talk to people who switch careers or leave or whatever. Um, but when you think back to the investment bankers, the Grubhub days, I mean, you were on the cover of magazines, all that stuff being interviewed. How many of those relationships endure nine years later? Um, not zero, but like not three, <laughs> you know, I, mean, I know, like I know. Or two. And that, that's why I'm asking the question. And, yeah. and, the, and those people that I connected with, I connected with for reasons other than the work situation. Interesting. Um, we just connected as people. Uh, uh, have you read Strength to Strength by Arthur Brooks? No, I haven't. Oh, fantastic book. And one of the insights, he talks about real friends and deal friends. And I read that last year, can't get it out of my head. But yeah, a lot of people are great people, but they're deal friends. They came with the deal. They were there because of Grubhub. They were there because of the IPO. They were there because of the growth or whatever. And a decade later, what are you left with? Yeah. Real friends. And as you say, yeah, it's probably one or two. All right. Can I ask you a question then? 
You should totally turn this around a little bit. Um, yeah, hundred percent. You make a lot of deal friends. You're talking to guests on podcasts. Mm-hmm. You have amazing conversations. Yep. And but they're but then they're over. Those relationships are over. That's gotta yeah. be hard. Yeah. You know what? It's it is and it's not. It was very clarifying to read. Like we're 560, 70 episodes in, whatever we are. So I've had over 500 conversations with some amazing leaders. And without naming names, a lot of them I could just email today or shoot a text to. And like John Mark Comer, we haven't hung out in person, but I could text him today. He'd get back to me and everything. And those are really wonderful people to know along the journey. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I had Malcolm Gladwell on last summer. He'd probably take my call if I called him. But, you know, there's that handful, like, who am I going to call? I'm going for coffee on Friday with a guy who lives 15 minutes from me. Mm -hmm. And he's in the podcasting world too, but he's a real friend, not just a deal friend. Yeah. And I think you've got the capacity for three to five of those. Like, I don't think you have the capacity for... 62 real friends. And there's lots of people like, you know, when we throw a party, we'll have dozens and dozens of people over, but that intimate little circle that you still track with, I think God actually designed to be small. Cause you look at Jesus, he had hundreds of disciples, then a group of 70, huh. then 12, then three, then the one. And I'm increasingly okay with that. So I'm enjoying these relationships. I love meeting people on the road, talking to people, talking to podcast listeners, meeting people in the Art of Leadership Academy, connecting with my guests. If I'm in a city, sometimes I'll text someone and say, you want to have dinner, you want to have lunch. Those are great. I also know that when I don't do this anymore, most of those relationships will melt away. But I will have, by the grace of God, a few really good friends, real friends. I don't know. Does that resonate, Mike? It does. I mean, I I certainly, yeah, I had 4,500 employees at Grubhub. Right. Wow. And, um, and, and I had some real relationships with people that I talk to every day. Right. And, mm-hmm. and people within the company and then outside the company. And then, yeah. And it's, uh, it is interesting, like trying to figure out whether losing those relationships was loss or they were that way by design. Cause I, I mm-hmm. am increasingly convinced of the importance of having three to five great friends. And, um, I'm also aware that in, in there's a, there's sort of an epidemic of men 35 to 50 that just don't have, have zero, that have zero friends. Correct. And Correct. Uh, it is really yeah. problematic. And I, I, and that may be true for women. I just don't know. But like, um, it, you know, it's funny because it's almost like an embarrassment of riches when you have hundreds of deal friends, right? <laughs> as you, as you uh-huh. said. Uh, and yet it can be very empty if you have zero, like really close relationships. Yeah, I agree. And I think even having those categories really helps me sort through. Like you reminded me of a real friend that I'm going to check in on this afternoon after we're done. Well, then this has been a productive conversation. Oh, it's been really (laughs) good. And, And you've got, you've, you know, and I think that's rich, but you're right. God assembled those people at Grubhub for a reason, 4,500. A lot of pastors take it personally because, you know, I've had friends who have left their churches and they go from 50 texts a day to five. Yeah. And it's like, whoa, whoa what just happened? Yeah. And real friends, deal friends. And I, I'm yeah. not bitter about it. I'm, I'm grateful that there are some real friends in the mix. My, uh, my pastor at the, ch- at the church that I was at when I did Grow Hub, uh, I, this isn't in the book, but because um, I couldn't uh-huh. fit it in the book, but he joined me for eight days on the bike trip in Missouri. Cool. Uh, and he, like, he took a day, he took a Sunday off, which he hadn't done in years to join me. Uh, and, um, and he's since gone on. And, uh, and so we don't communicate as much as we did, but I just, I just hung out with him last week, two weeks ago for the first time in like a year. But it's, it is interesting that, that, um, I, this issue is, seems like it's exacerbated for him as a pastor because Mm. all of his work and personal relations, they were the same thing. You can't, you can't, there's no distinction between work and personal relationships for him. And, uh, and I think, he, I think that's been, from what he said, that's been hard. It is very hard because, you know, when I was in law, even for that one year, law is what I did, but being a Christian, a husband, a father, that was who I was and a friend. And then you step into ministry and suddenly what you do is also what you believe. And your friends are also the people you serve or the people you're trying to reach. It gets really confusing. Like, 
Did you go through an identity crisis when you left Grubhub? Yeah. I mean, my email was Grubhub Mike. <laughs> so like, <laughs> I had to there delete that email address. Uh, that's uh-huh. digital identity, but on a deeper, more, less, like a more, less superficial way. Um, yeah. And st- still to this day, um, uh, separating out, I started a company is different from who I am, which is different mm. from the company I started now, which is also different from who I am. Um, cert- certainly. And we, yeah. we're built to work. I think we're designed to work and to be productive, I agree. And to be of use. I agree. And so, um, and so I think it's natural that we derive identity from our work. Um, yeah. And yet um, that, I mean, obviously that can't be everything. And so, um, yeah, I had an identity crisis. Who wouldn't, who wouldn't have an mm-hmm. identity crisis after? Uh, so what was career? that like? And, and how did you, I know we're coming up on time, but this is such a good convo. Um, what did that look like and how did you deal with it? The, the most obvious transition was wealth. I went from mm-hmm. not being wealthy to wealthy. And, um, the only defense against greed is, um, uh, giving money away. That's it. It's the only thing that works. You have to give money away immediately. First thing you do. Um, and so trying to figure out it, at first I went through a, I'm the same person. I just happen to have a bigger bank account. I'm still the guy who will always enjoy the conversation with the kid with the peanut butter chance more than anything. And I'm riding a bike across the country with my tent. Like prove to myself that, that like, it didn't change me, but I was wrong. It actually does. It, it does change you. And, uh, coming wow. to grips with those, that reality that, um, that it's not just a number in the bank that like you make different decisions and that re- affects, um, relationships that you have and, and, um, trying to come to grips with that instead of, instead of looking at it, um, pejoratively looking at it negatively, um, that was, that was hard. It's, it's a work and it's a work mm-hmm. in progress. Right. And it's as, as a country, we're really good at like saying rich people are the problem. And so like, it's kind of sucks being in that group, <laughs> but like, I know play yeah. with the smallest violin. Right. Like, but like, um, it, yeah, I mean, figuring all that out has been challenging. Um, figuring out how much of that I embrace and how much of it is separate for me. Um, that's been challenging, but then it, that's just one part of a lot of things that changed. Um, but aren't like, I think we're all growing in that way especially when we change careers, when we change jobs, when we go through big life transitions, um, we have to struggle with that. What are some changes you noticed when you became wealthy? You said it does change you. Um, I mean, I fly business class. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, fair. I'm not cramped in economy anymore. That was one change. Uh, uh-huh. and, and I mean, that sounds silly, but I worry about what that means for my daughter who Mm-hmm. isn't used to she's she's never flown in in economy uh and i worry what that does for how outlook on life as she grows and and i worry about what that means in terms of her being quote spoiled and trying to find what spoiled means and all of those things um and so that's that's been one thing is like figuring out you know i grew up in this one sort of way where money was tight and my daughter's not experiencing that and so um that's a big, that's a really big deal. Like, who am I? Who do I want her to be? How do I want to teach her that? How do I want to teach her these principles? Um, but I think, you know, more importantly, well, that's important. But another thing that happened was, um, I remember sitting in, in sermons at church and, and we would talk about the, the, the tough question, which is like, why, when somebody gets cancer, does God not heal them? And the answer to that question ends up being, the question why can't be answered and isn't the right question. The question, the, the question is what now? But we don't, we don't ask that same question with the same level of urgency when things go well for us. So, mm. so Grubhub did great. And it's really easy. When, when a person has big success, it's really easy to convince yourself. It was be, I'm the architect of my success. I did it. And, sure. and mm-hmm. the answer to the question why me is me because I'm the best because I did it and because I pulled this off, right? And whether or not that's true, it's still just as irrelevant a question as what now? Like, okay, I've had the mm. success. What's the obligation that comes with it? What, what does my life look like for the next how, one day or 30 years, however long I have left on this earth, right? Like the, that obligation is, um, it's just as much 
incumbent on a person to answer that, the what now question when, with blessing as it is with challenges. And it's so easy to avoid the question. It's so easy to just say, I deserve this and spend, go buy an island or whatever. I don't know what people do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but, yeah. Like, um, but the what now, the answer to that for me has been fixer. I'm creating an economic, I'm trying to create economic viability as an entry path in trades that's gender inclusive, right? Like that's the what now for me. Mm. Um, but that, I mean, that's obviously based on my like faith principles. And it's a, it's a conclusion I came to as I went through the bike ride. Um, but that was the, the biggest change was trying to avoid the, trying to avoid this, like, I deserve this sort of mentality and instead just be focused on like, what do I use these resources? Or if you want to use biblical term talents, for like what do i like what is this what's what's the obligation that comes with this you can't just bury it in the ground pretty pretty clear pretty clear principles uh, biblically about that like you have to do something with it you have to you have an obligation that comes with with blessing um and i have you know i've had so many people be like oh you were blessed because you were good mike and like that's not a biblical concept that's there's you can't find that anywhere in the bible right Uh, but Mm -hmm. you can find the obligation that comes with blessing so um yeah, I mean that's the other that's been the big transition from a from a from wealth perspective is it comes with a lot of obligation. Oof, that feels like a, a round two for me. This is this has been a really rich conversation. And I think I agree with you. There's some interesting things we don't get to all the time in the show. Like I do believe work preceded the fall, right? God gave Adam and Eve jobs in the Garden of Eden. Go name the animals that kind of thing. And uh, I used to I used to think that work was part of the curse. No, work got cursed, but it was actually God ordained and there appears to be work in heaven if you read the Bible in a certain Yeah, way. I mean there's, there's work stuff in Revelations to too. I don't know how to mm-hmm. interpret that book, but uh there's work in there. That's all say that much. But but it's noble, right? Yeah. And you're right. It always interests me when when and I know a number of these people, some are personal friends, some are podcast guests but who have, you don't have to lift a finger for the rest of your life kind of money. And then to see them saying, well, I'm trying to do gender inclusive uh, trade training for people and make a difference. That's really cool. I know another guy who's working in tech for the church, you know, and whenever I see him, I'm like, you could be on a private island somewhere with one of your yachts and you're not, you're investing it all back. And I think that's really, really true. And it gets to identity too, right? And I don't think our identity is fused to what we do, but perhaps it springs out of who we are, that what we do should spring out of who we are. If you're not leading a church anymore, okay. If you're not leading Grubhub anymore, okay, I'm not leading a church anymore, but I get to do this. And hopefully it makes a difference in someone's life. And maybe there'll be a day where I do something different, but I want to be contributing, you know, at 70, at 80, at 60, all of those things. It's just, just a cool conversation, Mike. Any final thoughts? Um, yeah, I mean, well, I put a lot of these ideas in the book, so yeah, <laughs> if yeah, I had yeah, a final yeah. thought, it would be check out the book. It's called Hangry. <laughs> yeah, there it is. A startup journal. It is not a typical corporate biography. It's somewhat autobiographical and it's a nice fusion of your corporate life and then the bike ride too. So always a few pages at the end of most chapters about the ride, but, uh, we'll link to it in the show notes and uh, great cover, a uh, biking up a mountain of pizza, slice of pizza. It's fantastic. Yeah, I love the cover. Yeah. When I saw, when I saw the graphic designer, I was like, this is magical. Yeah, it is. And who is it? It's uh, is it penguin who, who put uh, it out? Achette. Achette. Right, right, right. Anyway, fantastic. And where can people track with you online these days? Find fixer, find you online. Uh, I'm online at Mike And uh fixer is at fixer.com. If you're looking for a handy person membership, cause you don't want to, because, because you want somebody to professionally maintain your home. <laughs> yeah. You want to get your Saturdays back. Check yeah. it out. And does that, is that just for America or we have global? Yeah, we're in six well. cities, Chicago, Dallas, Denver, Phoenix, Seattle, and LA. You picked them well. Well, listen, Mike, thank you so much. All right. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it.